morning, everybody. If you have your Bible, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. As you're turning there, I want to go ahead and mention these graduates real quick. Uh, we're honoring Austin Clark, Matthew Spruill, and Destiny Sheriff, who is, she is not here today, but we're going to go ahead and mention her. Uh, I want to say congratulations to you guys. I know what you've gone through. I know you're excited to be out of high school. Uh, 18 years ago, I was right there with you. I'm getting old. But as you can take on the next chapter in your life, uh, whether you're going into college or the workforce, wherever you may be going, I've got several things pieces of advice that you need to take with you, that if you follow them, you'll be pretty well set up for the rest of your life. If you, if you're, if you find Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 1. And if you found it, please stand for the reading of God's Word. It says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the rain. And the day when the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and when those that look through the windows draw in, grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets, and the sound of grinding is low. When one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of music are brought low. Also they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden, and desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Remember your creator, but before the silver cord is loosened, or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to, to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright, words of truth. The words of the wise are like goats, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by these of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearing, wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment including every secret, whether good or evil. Let's pray. Fathers, we're here today lifting up these graduates, Father. Father, may we not forget that it is you who we, who we need to be praising, Father. Father, you set all things in motion. You've created all things, Father. You've even created us. Father, it's you that need to be praised. Father, as these graduates go throughout their lives, Father, let them remember who it is they need to be praising, who it is they need to be turning to, not man, Father, but you. Father, just be with us throughout this message, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've got several points for you here today. Point number one is probably the most important. <coughs> no God. Remember, Without him, nothing would be created. He is the one that created everything, and through him, all things were created. It's important to know the Lord before you encounter, encounter the difficulties of life. Without Jesus by your side, you can either easily drown in a sea of hardship. You may have endured hard times. I know many people that may have had hard times going through high school. You know, 17, 18 years old now. Don't know what all life has thrown your way. But know that the, the truth about life is it only gets harder. It never gets any easier. As you go throughout your life, 
you can get more responsibilities, whether it be a family, uh, bills, a job, responsible at work. Life gets much more difficult. Without God, life can be even harder. But with God, you can at least have someone to lean on in your times of need. You can have someone that you can look to, someone that will never leave you, and someone that will always be there with you. If you take the Lord with you, then you can better endure what lies ahead. You need to make sure that you've maintained your relationship with Him even when you get older. And as you get out on your own and make your own decisions, your life will be presented with different life philosophies that are contrary to the Bible. One of the, I've even been going to seminary. Uh, one of the classes, the, the very last class I just finished up, matter of fact, there was a part on there where the, I actually had to write a paper, uh, a two-page paper about the doctrine of election. Now, a lot of you don't understand what that is. Pretty much what the, what the professor was teaching was that God elects who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. God could pretty much say, Andy, I know you're a youth pastor. I know you've been following me for the past several years. I know you've been preaching the word. I know you've been teaching youth. I know you've been leading people to the Lord. But I didn't elect you to go to heaven. The guy out there, parchment on death row, that has always denied me, I actually elected him to go to heaven. That's what the doctrine of election is. If you read your Bible, you will understand that's not true at all. And that's in a seminary college. College taught by Bible scholars. People are going to come, you're going to run into people all along the way that have different philosophies on life. Know God. Don't follow their teachings. Follow God's teaching. If you follow God's teaching, you won't be set astray. You may be tempted to choose one of those paths. Again, if you know God, you know when that path comes your way, you know not to take it. You know that it's wrong. You know what God's Word says about that. Which leads me to my next point. Study your Bible. That Bible is the most important book you will ever own. Study. Read it. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 16 says, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things put them into remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about works to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more godliness. Like I say, as you continue your education, whether going to college or being trained for work or, or whatever, even going to work, you're going to run into people who have different philosophies on life. You need to understand People, instructors, and teachers, they may be knowledgeable about a subject, but God's, God's book is an instruction manual for life. If you have a question about life, how, what would God do about this? What would Jesus say about this? It's in the Bible. If you need direction on where to go from there, it's in the Bible. Everything you need to know about your life can be found here in the Bible if you study. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. God wants to fulfill your life. God wants to make your life more abundant. He wants it to be more joyful than you could ever imagine. If you want your life to be complete and to have meaning and be filled with joy, study the Bible. Follow Jesus. Look for what he says about things. Otherwise, there will be a void in your life. Have a firm foundation in Jesus. Luke 6, 46 through 49 says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, 
and not do the things which I say. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. The, he who heard it and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Set up a foundation of Jesus in your life. Study the Bible and grow a foundation. We we'll all have trials coming our way. <clears throat> it's just one of these things you can't get away from. It's going to happen. Expect it. If you have a strong foundation of God in your life, if you're standing firmly on His Word, you may get knocked down, but you can get back up. If you're not standing upon the Word of God, if you don't have a strong foundation in your life, your life can be torn to pieces. So many people have gone through life without the foundation of God in their lives, and they have been reduced to pretty much nothing. Get a strong foundation in your life. If you're afraid to plan it on, on the Word of God, you're going to overcome these trials. If not, your life's going to collapse. Stand on the Word and put your faith in Him alone if you're going to be successful in this world. The next point I have for you is to focus on the things of God and not the things of this world. So many times the world wants to tell us that we want to put our faith in money and materials and fame and fortune, all these different things. The world doesn't tell you right now to just turn your focus to God. That's kind of the unpopular unpopular stance right now. But if we if we put our our focus in material things, money, houses, all the things that the world says that we need, again, we don't have a strong foundation in God. Paul wrote about it in Philippians. In Philippians 3, 3 through 8, it says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteous with, righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things are gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. A lot of people look at that word rubbish and they have no idea what it means. Uh, unless you're British, you don't really use that word. Rubbish is actually worse than garbage. Paul looked at all these things, he reminded the, the readers of Philippians where he was, where he came from. And he told them, if you, have, if you think you have reasons to boast, I have more. Paul told me, he said, you know, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Big rule for the Jewish. I'm an Israelite. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I regard the law so well, I am a Pharisee. I've got such zeal for, that I was persecuting the church and I was faultless when it came to my list, legalistic righteousness. And it was all worth less than nothing. When we put our faith in things of the world, whether it's our accomplishments or things that, that we have, materialistic things, they are worth than nothing. We've all heard the story. I've heard the saying, you can't take it with you. It's true. It doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't matter how big of a house you have, or what kind of car you have, or anything like that, you can't take it with you. And in God's eyes, it is completely worthless. The only thing that really matters in this world is your relationship with God. Paul and others thought that these things were profit to him because they gave him position and clout. 
But when he experienced the greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, all those things paled into insignificance. Paul said that the prestige and the possessions and the power he enjoyed were actually hindrances to him. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that the call of Jesus teaches us that our relation to the Lord has been, excuse me, the relation to the world has been built on an illusion. The promise of the world is an illusion. The world tells you that if you have all these things, if, if you have status, if you have uh, position at your job, if you're higher up, and you've got all this money, you've got cars, houses, whatever, then you've got you've got the American dream. You've got everything you could ever ask for, and that is an illusion. Don't believe it. You may think that the promises and the substances are real, but they're not. You may think that those things can satisfy you, but they can't. You may even think those things are treasures. Paul said that they're rubbish. So how did Paul relate to riches and honor after the illusion of the world was blown to bits? In Philippians 4, 12 and 13, he said, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. <coughs> Paul's secret was to find contentment, joy, and pleasure, not on the in outward things, but on the inward things, in Christ alone. And God never changes. God is always the same. In his book, A Call to Die, David Nasser writes this story about a man named C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd was the Michael Jordan of his day in England. As a student in Cambridge University, he was the best athlete in the world. And everywhere he went, people adored him. His family was rich and lived on a large estate, and he was the talk of the country. What could be better for a young athlete? If television and product endorsements had been around in the late 19th century, Studd would have had dozens of offers to put his face on cereal, phone services, shoes, and soft drinks. But Studd considered Christ in the, in the direction of his life change. He, along with many others in a great movement of God at that time, decided to give up his career and go overseas to spread the gospel. Six other young men at Cambridge believed God was leading them to China, a country that was almost as remote and forbidding in that day as the moon. Many people, including some of Studd's family members, were appalled at the decision of these seven young men to go to China. They thought it was a tragic waste of their intellect, ability, ability, and potential. Still, these seven young men were determined to go. As a further display of his commitment, Stud gave away his inheritance from his father's estate so that he would have no advantage and no distractions in his missionary work. He and his friends served in the China Inland Mission for many years. Late, later, even in ill health after returning to England, Stud answered a call to go to Africa because he saw a sign on the door saying, Cannibals want missionaries. Christ and his cause were more important to him than anything the world offered. Prestige as the greatest athlete of his day, wealth or comfort, it was all rubbish to C.T. Stud. What do you consider important in your life? What are you looking for in your life? Is it fame, fortune, money, houses, cars, material things? Or is it God? God is the only thing worth having in this world. <coughs> the next thing is to be committed, not involved. So many of us believe that because we have a church membership, we are involved in the church. Strive to be committed, not involved. There's a big difference between being involved and being committed. And the best way I know how to, to distinguish that, and I hate to say it is in food, I love to eat. But when you really look at breakfast, you can see a difference between being involved and being committed. You see, a chicken's involved in breakfast. It lays the eggs, everybody loves eggs. 
The chicken is involved in breakfast, but the pig is committed. <laughs> he died to bring you bacon and sausage and all the really good stuff. That's the difference between being involved and being committed. What if Jesus was involved in your salvation but not committed? Things would be totally different. We wouldn't have the hope that we have now. But because he was committed, we have hope in our lives. We have hope for a brighter tomorrow. We have hope for a better life when we leave this earth. Life as we know it right here on earth is temporary. You need to remember that. This isn't permanent. It's temporary. A lifetime may seem like a really long time to us. But a lifetime is a drop in the bucket when it comes to eternity. You need to remember that. Where will you spend eternity? What if Jesus loved you the same way you love him? We don't like to think about that. So that's not a very popular question in the church. What if Jesus loves you the same way you love him? What if Jesus told you, well, you know, I'll love you for an hour or two this week. The rest of the time, I'm not, you know, not really, not really going to worry about you. Think about that. God's love is a never-ending love. No matter what you do, God will always love you. There's nothing you can do to make him stop loving you. Love, love God with all your heart, all your strength, and all your mind. Just like the Bible says. We need to be committed to God and His church. The next point I have for you is the most meaningful pursuit in this life is God. I know upon graduation it's, it's exciting to get out and pursue your options, whether it be in college or the workforce, wherever you may be going. And it's necessary for your financial security and well-being. Without the security of a job, then you're in no position to influence the world for Christ. But you need to make sure that your choice is not the end, but a means to an end. And that end being bringing glory to God. Your job should never become your sole reason for existence. Your career preparation should never distract you from your Bible studies or your relationship with Jesus. Be careful in balancing your Bible study and your school study. <clears throat> Remember, the most important book you can ever read is this Bible. Always keep in mind that the most important pursuit above your career is God. Jobs come and go. Your relationship with Jesus is forever. The last point I want you to be aware of is be who you say you're going to be. Whatever you do in life, bring glory to God. If you say you're going to be a ditch digger, dig that ditch. But do it to bring glory to God. If you say you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian. And do it and bring glory to God in every way you can. There's a story of a man and a woman going down the road. They were recently married on their way to the honeymoon. They were driving down the road and it was foggy out. And they were behind a slow moving truck. <coughs> they whipped out to pass this truck. And as they start going around the truck, they see a car coming, kind of popped out of nowhere. They swerved and missed the truck. And when they did, they lost control of their vehicle and hit a tree. The man comes to and he looks over at his wife and he sees his wife bleeding profusely. He begins to panic. Just like any other wreck, people begin to crowd around. He begins to holler out, somebody help me, I need a doctor. My wife needs a doctor. People started gathering around. One of the people that pulled up 
happened to be Dr. Johnson. People started cheering, saying, Dr. Johnson's here. Don't worry, Dr. Johnson's here. The man began to get his wife out of the car, and he carried her to the doctor. And he said, Doctor, please help me. My wife's bleeding. He said, Son, I can't help you. He said, No, Doctor, you don't understand. My wife's bleeding. If you don't do something, she's going to die. You've got to do something. And the doctor said, I can't. I retired a couple months ago from practicing medicine. I can't help you. The man looked at the doctor and he said, Doc, you've got two options. Either A, you help my wife, or B, you remove that title from your name. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, we need to be a Christian. We need to do all we can to bring glory and honor to God. Be who you say you're going to be. Not just one day a week, not just for a couple hours a week, 24-7. Be the man or woman God calls you to be. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, then live in a manner that brings honor and glory to God. Because anything worth doing is worth doing right. This time I want to recognize Matthew and Austin. The last few would please come up. Again, Destiny is not here today. I've got something for you guys. These are the most important books of your life, guys. Instruction man of a lot. You want to talk about treasures? That's where your treasure. That's where you're going to find them, right there. Share those books, read them, study them. They will help you through life. God can be your friend and your confidence. You just love it. Congratulations, guys. Somebody guiding your life. 
And I've got one other tidbit. If it's you got in your life, you're still going in the wrong direction. Because I'll speak for myself. Every time I've ever led my own life, I've gone the wrong way. We need to go with the one who knows where he's leading us. If you would, please stand. <coughs> Heads bowed, eyes closed. Thank you to play. This is going to be an invitation time. God spoke to your heart this morning. You may be going through some struggles in life. You, Andy talked about building on that foundation. Uh, sometimes we don't build on the right foundation. If you're building on the foundation of wealth and prosperity, if you're building on the foundation of self, that shift in sand. This morning I encourage you, it's time to take a step in the right direction. As a church, as, as members of this church, we need to step out and say, I, I don't want to just be a part. I, I don't want to just be active as far as being on a roll. I want to be committed. There's a huge difference. We're lacking a lot of commitment today. If you want to see your life on the right track, it's by committing to God, committing your life to God, committing your resources to God, committing your family to God. I praise God for the way my family has turned out, the things that God has done. But it was not by accident. It was by a daily commitment to God, praying for my family every day, trying to live an example every day, falling short every day, but getting back up the next day and seeking once again to try to do everything I could to honor God with my life, with my profession, and with my family. Are you willing to commit your everything to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you willing to commit your life and your family and everything that you have? Because our life is fleeting. And I, as a pastor, I sit with so many families who are saying, my family's falling apart. My marriage is in trouble. My children are in trouble. They've gone the wrong, what, gone the wrong way. Maybe it's because we haven't given our marriage the right foundation. We haven't given our family the right foundation, our children the right foundation. This morning, I encourage you, not just for these students, but for each of us, to make a commitment today, I'm going to put everything on the right foundation. There are these few moments I'm going to ask you just to go before God, pour out your heart. This altar is open. You may be here this morning and you're in need of prayer. Please, please don't leave here without coming and talking with me. Allow me the opportunity to pray with you and encourage you. Whatever it is, just please be obedient to God's God.